All right, welcome to uh, our Bible class entitled Lesson from, uh, Lessons from the Kings, Ancient Wisdom for Modern Times. This is lesson number eight in this series and the title of this particular lesson is King Hanan, Suspicious Mind. A suspicious Mind and if you want to follow along in your Bibles, please open them to 1 Chronicles chapter 19. And as always, we'll be putting the scriptures up on the screen. Well, I want to begin this story simply by reading a passage in 1 Chronicles 19, beginning in verse 1. It says, Now it came about after this that Nahash, the king of the sons of Ammon, died, and his son became king in his place. Then David said, I will show kindness to Hanan, the son of Nahash, because his father showed kindness to me. So David sent messengers to console him concerning his father. And David's servants came into the land of the sons of Ammon to Hanan to console him. But the princes of the sons of Ammon said to Hanan, Do you think that David is honoring your father in that he has sent comforters to you? Have not his servants come to you to search and to overthrow and to spy out the land? So Hanan took David's servants and shaved them and cut off their garments in the middle as far as their hips, and sent them away. Then certain persons went and told David about the men, and he sent to meet them, for the men were greatly humiliated. And the king said, Stay at Jericho until your beards grow, and then return. When the sons of Ammon saw that they had made themselves odious to David, Hanan and the sons of Ammon sent a thousand talents of silver to hire for themselves chariots and horsemen from Mesopotamia, from Aram Makkah, and from um, Zobah. So they hired for themselves 32,000 chariots and the king of Makkah and his people who came and camped before Mediba. And the sons of Ammon gathered together from their cities and came to battle. When David heard of it, he sent Joab and all the army, the mighty men. The sons of Ammon came out and drew up in battle array at the entrance of the city. And the kings who had come were by themselves in the field. Now when Joab saw that the battle was set against him in front and in the rear, he selected from all the choice men of Israel, and they arrayed themselves against the Arameans. But the remainder of the people he placed in the hand of Abishai, his brother, and they arrayed themselves against the sons of Ammon. He said, if the Arameans are too strong for me, then you shall help me. But if the sons of Ammon are too strong for you, then I will help you. Be strong and let us show ourselves courageous for the sake of our people and for the cities of our God. And may the Lord do what is good in his sight. So Joab and the people who were with him drew near to the battle against the Arameans and they fled before him. When the sons of Ammon saw that the Arameans fled, they also fled before Abishai, his brother, and entered the city. Then Joab came to Jerusalem. When the Arameans saw that they had been defeated by Israel, they sent messengers and brought out the Arameans who were beyond the river, with Shopak, the commander of the army of Hadadezer, leading them. When it was told David, he gathered all Israel together <coughs> excuse me, and crossed the Jordan and came upon them and drew up in, in formation against them. And when David drew up in battle array against the Arameans, they fought against him. The Arameans fled before Israel, and David killed the Arameans, 7,000 charioteers and 40,000 foot soldiers, and put to death Shopak, the commander of the army. So when the servants of Hadadezer saw that they were defeated by Israel, they made peace with David and served him. Thus the Arameans were not willing to help the sons of Ammon anymore. Then it happened in the spring, at the time when kings go out to battle, that Joab led out the army and ravaged the land of the sons of Ammon, and came and besieged Rabbah, but David stayed at Jerusalem and Joab struck Rabbah and overthrew it. David took the crown of their king from his head and he found it to weigh a talent of gold and there was a precious stone in it and it was placed on David's head and he brought out the spoil of the city a very great amount. He brought out the people who were in it and cut them with saws and with sharp instruments and with axes. And thus David did to all the cities of the sons of Ammon. Then David and all the people returned to Jerusalem. All right, so there's a, a long passage, but it was easier to, you know, to read the passage, read the story, than to kind of break it down and just paraphrase it. And if you're lost, the story in the, if you've lost the story in some of the strange names, you know, the ancient names, this is basically what happened. 
Uh, when David was on the run from Saul, he received help from Nahash, who was Hanan's father. Um, they joined together against Saul's um, uh, uh, forces. Now when Nahash died, David tried to form an alliance with his son Hanan as a favor, because David was much stronger than him and he figured this would, you know, this would be the return of a favor. Hanan and his advisors were suspicious of David's intentions because there was a time when these two nations had been at war. So what happens is that Hanan humiliated the ambassadors that David sent. He made them you know, return without any pants and he shaved their beards as a way of you know, rejecting the offer of peace and alliance. Now once they realized the extent of their offense, Hanan and his advisors prepared for war by bringing in mercenaries from surrounding nations to fight the, the Israelites. And so the rest of the story uh, describes how David destroyed these people, but he did it in three different phases. Be a little uh, easier to understand if we just break those up. Phase number one, Joab, David's chief military commander, defeats the Ammonite army and the local mercenary forces uh, in an in a, uh, initial battle. So that's one battle. <clears throat> then, number two, um, uh, David himself leads the troops against Hadadezer, uh, a more powerful Aramean king uh, that is brought in by Hanan. So the first group is defeated, so Hanan goes and gets you know, a bigger army, a more powerful king to, to work for him, and David destroys this man. And then thirdly, the final stage came in the spring. The war stopped because of, of winter. Uh, and it was during this spring campaign, while Joab was making a final attack on Hanan's capital city, uh, actually that, that David had his affair with Bathsheba. So those, uh, he doesn't, uh, the writer doesn't include that story here, but this is when that happened. Anyways, Joab did defeat the city and David went to remove the crown of Hanan and, uh, and he put the people into slavery. One uh, small note that I need to make here, uh, he even made the people tear down the walls of their own homes and their fortress. Sometimes the way it is written here, it, it, uh, it could be interpreted that uh, David cut the people up with saws and this and that, and he didn't do that. He, in other words, they cut up their homes and their fortresses and so on and so forth with tools uh, after they were enslaved uh, by uh, David. So from David's perspective, this story is a good historical account of how David and Joab and the military carried out uh, not only diplomacy, but also how they carried out wars you know, almost 2,700 years ago, a little insight into how things operated then. But from Hanan, you know, the king, from Hanan's perspective, it teaches us a valuable lesson on the dangers that result from having a suspicious mind. Because that's the, that's the title of this particular lesson. You know, Hanan's suspicious mind. Sorry to disappoint you Elvis fans if you were thinking I was going to talk about the the old Elvis song, but uh, that's not what this is about. This is about Hanan, King Hanan, and the suspicious mind that he had. You know, it would have greatly helped Hanan if he knew the difference between suspicion and caution. He didn't know the difference between the two. For example, suspicion is based on feelings, uh, intuition. Uh, suspicion is, is, is intuitive in nature. It's an impression based on external signals mixed with our preconceived ideas and character. For example, Hanan, you know, he was a pagan, he was insecure, he was new to his job. His father had died, he took over the kingdom. Um, he knew that the Israelites had once been enemies in the past, he knew that, you know, didn't have the full story, didn't have everything that had happened between David and his father. And so David's offer through these kind of eyes, okay, was seen as suspicion, suspicious rather, was seen as a, some kind of threat. Now, the difference between suspicion and caution, so suspicion, you know, subjective feelings, external sign, preconceived ideas. Caution is different. Caution is based on fact. It's based on communication. It's, it's not, what we feel about something, but what we know to be true because of knowledge about something. And usually through investigation and communication. 
Uh, for example, Hanan could have reserved judgment until he had direct communication with David. David sends his emissaries, proposes this alliance. You know, Hanan could have you know, invited David to come and have a meeting with him, uh, pose questions, even raise some of his concerns. Uh, but he didn't do that, you see, he didn't do that. That would have been cautious. And so the Bible says that caution or prudence seeks knowledge and avoids needless battles, Proverbs 13, 16, and also uh, 22, verse three. So caution has a kind of a go slow approach. Uh, it reserves the decision or the judgment until enough facts can be gathered. Suspicion, on the other hand, goes by feeling and usually wants to believe the worst. You know, we want to believe the worst. When we're suspicious, we, we, we tend to believe the worst about people. And any little sign that can confirm our suspicions becomes a fact. A very dangerous, a very dangerous thing. So Hanan was obviously a very suspicious man and his attitude and actions provide some important lessons for us today because many of us struggle with the problem of having a suspicious mind. You know, remember the, the title of this uh, lesson series about the, the kings are lessons we can learn from the kings. And so far we've talked about kings that we're kind of familiar with, right? Hanan is not one of those kings. We're less familiar with him. It's just a brief story about him. But his, the lessons we learn from his failings can be quite, uh, quite important for us uh, even in this day. And so let's, uh, let's take a look at some of the lessons uh, that we learn from, uh, from Hanan. First of all, suspicion leads to trouble. Suspicion leads to trouble. Hanan found out that groundless suspicion often leads to trouble. In other words, he let others feed his suspicious mind with false information. So if you're suspicious by nature, then everyone and everything seems to have evil motives. This kind of attitude doesn't allow for the building of relationships with people because you're always fearing what you feel will be the worst about them. You know, one of the things that I've noticed is that people who have suspicious minds don't have many friends. You, know, you, 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 you cannot develop deep, meaningful relationships with people if you have a suspicious mind. You're always thinking that they're out to get you. You're always interpreting whatever they say uh, you know, as something negative against you personally. Suspicious, you know, suspicion is based in fear. I mean, a lot of reasons why people are, are like that. We're dealing mostly here with the outcomes of suspicion. Of course, being, you know, having a suspicious mind leads to quick accusations and unfair judgments of people and, and situations. Suspicious people already have their minds made up, so there is no room for explanation, no room for the benefit of the doubt. And so suspiciousness will cause us to make rash and unfair judgments and decisions that we're likely to regret, as we see in the case of, of Hanan. You know, um, um, sometimes uh, people say, you know, I'm, I'm awfully critical about people. You know, I, I wish I wasn't so critical. You know, how, do I, how do I get a handle on that? Well, suspicious minds and suspiciousness go hand in hand with overcriticalness. If you're overly critical, probably one of the things, one other thing that you, know, that you may struggle with is, is having a suspicious mind. And so sometimes uh, um, just dealing with the idea of being critical, just dealing with that fault, that character weakness uh, is not enough. Uh, if we want to deal with that character weakness, usually we need to deal first with our suspicious mind. Uh, the idea that we immediately jump to negative conclusions concerning the actions of other people and that negative conclusion leads us to do what? Well, to offer criticism, to see things in a critical light. So all I'm saying is if, if you want to work on an overly, uh, overly critical attitude, begin first uh, with uh, dealing with uh, you know, uh, being, uh, having an overly suspicious uh, mind. Uh, so problems with the suspicious mind, one, leads to trouble, two, 
uh, do not cover a mistake with another mistake. A suspicious mind often leads us to make mistaken judgments and then unfortunately pride will lead us to try to cover that mistake with more bad decisions. You know, one bad thing leads to another bad thing. Hanan made a dreadful mistake in judgment and he made a deadly move in humiliating David's emissaries because in a sense he was not only uh, um, uh, humiliating them but he was humiliating David because they were his emissaries. So instead of acknowledging the mistake and then making an attempt at an apology and a reconciliation, he chose to multiply his errors by going to war and going to war with someone more powerful than him. I mean, he knew that. And I've seen this happen. You know, when people make a bad decision and then they, 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 they try to cover it up. You know, they'll lie, for example, to try to cover it up. You know, a single a uh, couple goes too far, let's say sexually, and then they get an abortion to eliminate the problem. Uh, hopefully this is not the case in our, in our, uh, among our brothers and sisters in Christ, but we, I've seen this take place. We see that out in the world. Two friends argue and begin to tear each other down to others in an effort to show that they were right. And in the end, what, they, what do they do? They ruin a beautiful friendship, a long time friendship. So we know the old story, the two wrongs certainly don't make a right, but suspicious people have a hard time with this concept because their basic problem is that they believe that they're always right and anyone else who disagrees with them immediately becomes suspect. So if you want to work backwards, you know, suspicious mind, uh, excuse me, uh, being overly critical uh, leads back to what? Well, to a suspicious mind. What does that lead back to? Well, it leads back to uh, uh, you know, a prideful attitude. How can I be wrong? I'm right. You know, my take on everything is right. My assessment of every situation is right. My uh, you know, assessment of that person, how they're like, what they do, so on and so forth, I'm right. How can I be wrong? Something to think about. Problems with a suspicious mind leads to trouble many times covers a mistake with another mistake. Three, when you're wrong, no amount of power will make you right. Hanan made a foolish decision because he was naturally suspicious. And then when it, came, it became evident that this was a fatal choice, he tried to use force to confirm his convictions. The Bible tells us that he lost the war, he lost his nation, and his own personal freedom and his position. You know, they took the crown away from him and they you know, put it on David. How's that for humiliation? Nietzsche, the philosopher, proposed the idea that the most powerful be the ones that make the rules and establish what is right and wrong. This is morality by force or you know, might makes right. But what is essentially right, what is essentially good and proper has been established by God from the very beginning of time and no human power or might is able to change what is basically right or wrong. You know, to lie or to steal, this is wrong, no matter what. You know, whether you do it in the guise of um, the military, whether you do it under the cloak of darkness you know, as a burglar, whether you do it with a, you know, a keystroke, you know, changing numbers in a bank account from this place, to that place, uh, you know, to lie and to steal, this is wrong. Even, in, even if Hanan had won the war against David, he still would have been wrong and would have had to answer eventually you know, to God. And so you can't make wrong right with power. Well, it's not enough just to point out the problem, of course. Lessons from the kings, you know, uh, we want to certainly be able to learn something for ourselves. So this uh, story is ancient, uh, but the problems and the lessons are contemporary and they're relative. How can we avoid Hanan's mistakes? How can we neutralize our own suspicious natures? A couple of suggestions. Number one, check it out. Solomon says, a prudent man acts with knowledge. 
Proverbs 13, verse 16. Check it out. If you're not sure, if your intuition sends out a warning, check it out so you can base your feelings on facts and not simply facts on feelings. You see what I'm saying? Your feelings should be based on facts, not the other way around. All right? Knowing the facts, taking the time to know will help avoid jumping to hasty conclusions. You know, we do this a lot of times, we do this uh, online. Every day I get stuff you know, from people that send me forward, you know, we all do, we get stuff people forward to us. Uh, a story or an episode or you know, a book or something you know, online, a quote that confirms their suspicion about a certain thing or a certain politician or a, sp a certain policy or a certain place or person. You know? And they'll forward this thing and it's, it's bogus. It's not true. It's a, uh, what do they call it? Uh, you know, it's a legend uh, that's just good, that goes round and round and round all the time. And why does this happen? Because people do not check many times. They don't verify the material that they forward. They don't check to see if it's actually true, uh, to make sure it's not, you know, that's it, an urban legend that goes round and round. You know, like, oh, they're going to remove in God we trust on the money, you know, or something like that. So check it out, no matter what it is. You think your friend, your friend has said something bad about you and so on and so forth before you confront them, before you, you, know, before you get mad, before you plot revenge. Hopefully you wouldn't want to do that. You know, check it out, get the facts, so important. Uh, number two, take people as they are. I mean, not everybody is like, like us or lives up to our criteria of the perfect person. Isn't it funny, we want our friends to live up to this high moral you know, standard, this high standard of conduct. We want them to like us and treat us you know, as Jesus would. And many times we hold them to a much higher standard than we hold ourselves. That's, that's the hard part. So allow people just to be themselves. Allow situations to explain themselves until proven otherwise. You know, we save ourselves and others a lot of pain and trouble if we avoid second guessing everybody else's motives. That's the point. You know, one of the ways that I approach things, you know, until I learn differently, I'll take a person at their word. I'll take a person at their word, especially my friends, I'll take them at their word until I learn differently. And if I learn differently, you know what I'll do? I'm going to check it out to make sure that I don't jump to false conclusions because friendships are precious. Family ties are precious. And I know that Satan works very hard at breaking up our uh, alliances, among Christians especially among Christian brothers and sisters and friends in Christ and family. He will prefer us to be isolated and to be at war with those that we love rather than to be in a good relationship with those that we love. So be careful. You know, the accuser, they call the devil the accuser of the brethren. Sometimes he's the one whispering in our ear or in our hearts concerning uh, the meaning behind what a friend of ours has said or a family member, what they have done. We read into the activity. We read into what the person has said rather than simply take it at face value or checking it out. We jump to the conclusion that we've either been insulted or there's something wrong or we've done something wrong. It's okay to go to a friend or a family member and say, are we okay? You know, I, I, I noticed perhaps that you know, somehow there's some miscommunication going on. Are we okay? And what I've found out most of the time when you ask that question you know, to whoever, are we okay? The person usually, usually says, well, yeah, sure. Oh, well, Tuesday. Oh, well, I didn't tell you. you know, my father had a car accident. I was so stressed out and that. And, oh, okay. Oh, the explanation comes. That explains the behavior. 
or the opposite may happen. Are we okay? And then the other person says, well, I'm glad you asked me that because the other day you said this and that and you know, uh, I was offended by that or I, I thought perhaps uh, you, know, you, 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 you misunderstood what I said. You, know, you, you work things out. Um, but you can't work things out if you simply jump to a conclusion about someone and then what do we do? We jump to a conclusion then we give them the cold shoulder. <laughs> we give them the silent treatment. Boy, that's a way to really build a relationship, isn't it? So check it out. Take people as they are. Number three, trust God. You know, the essential difference between Hanan and David was not military and it wasn't culture, it was faith. David trusted God to protect and guide him in his affairs, in his military affairs. Hanan trusted human advisors and his own suspicious mind. Suspicion is a sign of fear and insecurity. Faith in God is the greatest antidote to these and the only way to calm a suspicious mind. I know certainly when I'm you know, falling into that, not trap, but falling into that, that mindset, being suspicious or questioning someone, before I even say to the person, are we okay? I will go to God first and I'm going to ask Him, am I okay? Lord, you know, uh, search me. Bring to my mind, give me insight into what I may have done to cause something, what I may have said. Remember, we're not, we're not looking, we're not, as Christians, we don't look to win arguments. We don't look to win wars. We don't, our goal is not to be right. You know what I'm saying? I was right and you were right. That's not our goal. Our goal is to be at peace with our brothers and sisters with our enemies, to be at peace with those in our, in our family, even those who are difficult to be at peace with. Our goal is to be at peace. We're, we're called to be those people that seek peace. Blessed are the peacemakers. We, we tend to see that on a kind of worldwide basis. You know, the Secretary of State meeting with the heads of this government and that government to kind of you know, work out some peace treaty. And yes, it works at that level, but it also works at the individual level. The peacemaker, you know, to be a peacemaker in my home between my wife and I or my children or my friends. Very, very, very important. And so sus suspicious minds can lead us to make bad decisions about people and, and keep us isolated and perpetually stuck in the vicious cycle of fear and insecurity. Like I said, people have a suspicious mind, usually lonely. So when you make a mistake or you hurt someone because of this weakness, apologize. Acknowledge the reasons why you did what you did. Cut your losses and make things right as soon as you can. Don't bluff or you know, make it, you know, warm it over, or, you know, smooth it over with uh, you know, a throwaway line. If you're making an apology, make an apology. Now, if you're looking for a change of heart in this area, a couple of suggestions. Replace suspicion with caution. This is the true biblical virtue perverted into suspiciousness by fear and poor self-worth. In other words, if I have a tendency to have a suspicious mind, what should I be shooting for? Because you know, I am fearful and I am nervous that somebody will take advantage of me or I'll lose or you know, I'll be gypped somehow. Somebody will gyp me out of money or you know, whatever. I, I've got, how, what do I replace that with? How can I you know, meet that, that emotional need of mine? Well, replace suspicion with caution. It's okay to be cautious. It's okay to be prudent, not to jump in with both feet without checking things out first. That's a good thing. That's a sign of maturity and leadership. Number two, be more accepting and forgiving of people as they are and you will see that others will begin treating you in the same way. You know, judge not lest ye be judged. Certainly we have to make a decision or judge when things are right or wrong or you know, so on and so forth. Uh, here the judgment is in the sense of criticism. 
If you don't want to be criticized, if you don't want people to have you know, that attitude towards you, then you, you need to have that attitude towards them. That's nothing new, we, we know of that. Remember I said, you know, it's okay to accept people as they are. Don't try to change them. The only, remember, the only person you can change is who? It's yourself. Work on yourself. Work on being a more accepting and forgiving person. Don't be afraid of everything. You know, God, God's got your back. God will be able to protect you if you put your life, your resources into His hands. Be more accepting and forgiving of people. And of course, as I said, have more faith in God to protect your life and to protect your interests. Trust Him to help you discern what and who is good and what and who uh, is evil. So marvelous to go from being suspicious to being cautious, from being suspicious to being accepting, uh, from being suspicious to having faith in God, that God in the end will protect you, will help you, will uh, guard you against the, the evil one. I make that prayer all the time for myself. Lord, please, I'm, 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 I'm weak. I need you to protect me against the evil one, against the evil in society. Please protect my children. Watch over our grandchildren. Let no bad thing happen to them. Let no, you know, restrain the evil one from interfering in their lives. That's a valid prayer, especially for oneself, if we tend to have a suspicious mind. Well, okay, that's the story of Hanan and Hanan's suspicious mind. I hope we've drawn a couple of good lessons for our Christian life uh, in the here and now. We're going to continue with this series next time. Thanks very much for your attention.